So we have Andrew Lordahl. He is an Abbott representative. I've worked with him for many years and um, he's incredibly knowledgeable. And I think that, you know, it's going to be good to get a little experience firsthand for somebody who is in the field. Um, obviously, we're going to work on getting um, other manufacturer um, representatives as well to kind of get their firsthand knowledge because they really, you know, know the in and outs of their devices. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, to learn from him and go through this talk. So if you want to take it from here, Andrew, we're excited to learn. Sure. Um, we'll start off by saying thank you, AJ, and everyone else for allowing me to do some education here. Um, it's definitely a, a privilege to be able to work with you guys and um, kind of expand everyone's knowledge and offer my insight as well. So kind of the goal behind what I want to talk about today is we're going to go through two separate case studies. Um, I have a bunch of EGMs that I'll be kind of talking through. And then we can kind of talk about how the device is functioning inherently in both of them. We require reprogramming of the device. And we'll talk about why we reprogram in certain situations. Um, there's even some screenshots on where to navigate on our programmer. Um, so that'll be cool for you guys to see, but definitely want to keep it informal. So if you have any questions throughout the whole presentation, um, feel free to just speak up where I think AJ is going to be monitoring the chat. So you can definitely throw your question in the chat, but let's kick off here. So first case study we're going to kind of talk about is T-Wave over sensing. And I kind of gave away the answer to the question here. So what's T-Wave over sensing? Um, so patient background here. So to start with the system. So the patient that we're going to be talking about had a CRTD system from Abbott. Um, the 2088, so going through the model numbers here, that's our atrial lead, um, single coil DF4 RV lead, so the 7122, that's a single coil lead, and then we have our quadrupolar LV lead, um, and all this was implanted in June of 2020. Um, so essentially the background here is the clinic where the patient was remotely followed, got a ton of alerts. Um, what we call non-sustained RV over-sensing alerts. And to simplify that, that's just the device letting us know that there is some sensing abnormality that was detected on the device. Um, so when we get these alerts, we definitely need to take a deeper dive into looking at the EGMs um, that were transmitted to us and really kind of trying to pick apart what's going on and then decide is it something that we can address via reprogramming. Um, is it something that maybe we just monitor for now, depending on what's going on? And so we can kind of see these sensing anomalies often, especially with ICDs, um, because obviously the goal with an ICD is we want to be able to sense VF and VT um, and not sense anything other than that, essentially. Um, but because these devices are very sensitive, you can naturally run into situations where you maybe sense the T wave, um, you could sense uh, EMI, uh, even myopotentials or or um, diaphragm potentials, so muscular. Um, so, got these alerts. Let's check out what's going on here. So, this is a snippet of the episode that we were given remotely, and before we kind of dive into what's going on here, I just want to orient everybody with the strip itself and the different kind of channels that we're looking at. Um, so if we start at the top here, so right below episode, we have our atrial sense channel. So this is what the atrial lead is seeing. So we're seeing all these P waves coming through. That's the first channel here. If we step below here, so the second row here, that's our leadless channel. And in our CRT devices, that channel is essentially a far field view looking from the right atrial lead, the tip to the RV lead um ring and so that kind of gives us a cross chamber view of what's going on um and then if we go down to the third row here that's our vsense amp so that's our channel that the rv lead is seeing um and then lastly if we go down to the fourth channel where we see these vsense markers that's our what we call discrimination channel so that's a far field view and that utilizes the rv coil to the rv can and so just high level overview of why we have different channels is it allows us to see the same thing in different ways. And that can be advantageous when we're maybe troubleshooting 
um, when we're trying to diagnose an arrhythmia, if it's like an SVT versus a VT, having a far field channel is advantageous because we can really look at morphology and see if it's a wider complex, maybe indicating VT or VF, or if it's more narrow, indicating an, uh, an atrial driven arrhythmia. Um, and then lastly, the bottom kind of column here or bottom row, sorry, is our marker channel. So these little ticks, as you see, that go across the bottom of the screen, that just lets us know what the device is seeing itself. Um, so I just wanted to orient everybody with this first. Um, so as we kind of look through what's going on here, we see there's some repetitive pattern that seems to be occurring. And so if I start on the marker channel all the way at the bottom on the left-hand side, I don't know if you can see my mouse where I'm currently pointing, but... Um, yes, looking... we can see your mouse. Okay. So right where my mouse is, we're going to start here. So we have an A sense, we sense a P wave, and then we correctly track that and by V pace. That's all normal device function. And then if we kind of follow along here where my mouse is, we see another mark, which means the device saw something. But if we look up and follow this up to all of our channels, we see that there's really nothing going on in terms of an R wave. And so that kind of puts our, uh, raises a, a red flag a little bit. And, and we're kind of wondering, all right, what's going on? What, what is the device seeing that it shouldn't be seeing? Um, but if we follow along here, so our next marker here, that's another P wave. So that's just a sinus beat coming through. We, in this situation, don't track that. And I'll talk about why we don't do that in a second. But if we notice that this pattern is very repetitive, so we're by V pacing, and then we're seeing something that the device is sensing that we don't want to sense, essentially. Um, so I guess before I get into it, does anyone want to take a stab at what they think is going on here, either if you want to just come off mute or if you want to maybe throw something in the chat. Um, what's going on? What's the device seeing? Kind of describe the behavior if you can. And AJ, just let me know if anyone threw something in the chat. I'll give it a couple seconds. Yeah, and if you'd like to speak, you can just raise your hand and we can give you uh... Uh, permission there to talk. Definitely uh, an open forum, so don't feel pressured. Um, we're here to learn and kind of educate everyone, but any brave souls that want to take a stab at it? So I'll risk embarrassing myself here. <laughs> um, so the ventricular rate is pretty steady and it could be that we're not capturing and you're seeing non-sustained RV over sensing. So we're ventricularly not capturing, but it's happening to coincide with the intrinsic um, atrial and ventricular rate. Or it could be something of an idiosyncrasy with the timing where we are at fusing because there is a little morphological difference on the um, number four, the discriminator channel, where yeah. you could argue that we are having some sort of functional capture or and contributing to the uh, to the intrinsic so it could be non-capture it could be functional non-capture and it could be what i would say is most likely is fusion with the bi-v pace um, we are over sensing the t wave because it's more intrinsic than it is a paced event so we're ending ending up with a little bit more um of a wider, it affects the blanking system. So we're over sensing the T wave, the device is then calling that um, another ventricular event. It's blanking the atrial event um, due to the PVC as it's interpreting it. And then the next intrinsic ventricular event is um, flagged as a over sensor PVC. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, so this is really kind of a loaded EGM. There's a lot going on here. Um, so the overarching issue here is that we're over sensing the T wave. Um, so if we see following every by V pace, we see that there's a mark on the marker channel that aligns with where we'd expect the T wave to fall. And if we follow that across every by V pace, it looks pretty consistent. The interval looks the same. Um, and if you even kind of follow up to our third V sense channel, so where my mouse is, it looks like you can kind of see a little bit of a 
deflection that can indicate we're looking at a T wave. Um, so that's what's going on here. To AJ's point, he made a really good, um, really good insight on morphology on our far field channel. So that kind of lets us know that something's going on with the bi-v pace. Are we capturing um, what's actually going on here is the bi -V paces, I would say, are capturing. It looks like morphology for every bi -V pace looks pretty similar. A reason why this is problematic is because due to the fact that we're oversensing the T wave, as AJ mentioned, the, the following atrial event is falling into what we call refractory. And the refractory period is essentially a time where the device will see the atrial P wave. So this little guy where my mouse is hovering around, the device sees it, but because it, but because it falls into refractory, we're not able to track it and follow with a bi V pace. So this next speed here where my mouse is, is actually an intrinsic conducted R wave. Um, so because of this pattern, we're seeing intrinsic R waves conducted through because the device cannot properly track the P waves. And so when we think about a patient that requires or benefits from CRT therapy, aside from T wave oversensing here, this patient is not getting their CRT therapy that we want them to get because we're not able to track every other P wave. Um, so that's definitely an issue. Um, to take a step back here, when we have CRT devices put in, the goal is to pace them all the time. Um, so we really want to see a 99% or even 100% by V pace percentage because um, we really want to try to optimize their squeeze between the LV and RV. So anytime that the patient is not receiving CRT or by V therapy, um, that's that's an issue that we'd want to address. And so because of this T wave oversensing pattern, that's kind of another um, factor that's resulting from this device behavior. Um, so I'll kind of walk through what I just talked about. So appropriate sense atrial activity on the first channel, that looks good. We capture with a bi -V pace. Morphology looks like we're capturing. And then kind of what I alluded to before. So this next mark is falling right where we expect a T wave to be. Um, and so this is what we would call T wave over sensing or short, we abbreviated TWOS. So if we follow this EGM along, um, you can have T wave over sensing either following a sensed intrinsic beat, or you can, in this case, you can have post paced T wave over sensing. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, so it's it can happen in both situations. Um, in a couple slides, we'll show that you can actually customize the programming for a post paste over sense situation, which we see here, or you can even customize our sensing settings if it's a sensed T wave over sensing. Um, so that would just be following an intrinsic R wave. You could see both. Typically, in my experience, we I tend to see it more following a bi V pace, um, but you could see it in both situations. So moving along here, because we're resetting our timing cycle with the T wave, this next true intrinsic P wave is now falling into what we call P VARP. And P VARP is the period where the device will see what's going on in the atrium, but it won't act or track anything. And I guess to pose a question here, does anyone know why we have P VARP? Why is it required on a device? I won't let AJ answer that one. Um, so maybe we can say something, AJ. No, I think uh, if you want to go ahead and jump into it, we we just covered PVARP the other week. Um, so I think if if you can describe it too, it would be helpful though. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, Dr. Yakuba from the GRU said uh, PMT. That is correct. Yep. So PVARP is a refractor period that is designed to prevent PMT. So in PVARP, there's actually two kind of, or, or sub blanking period in PVARP that we call blanking or PVAB. So post-ventricular atrial blanking. And in that period, that's when the atrial channel is completely, has its eyes closed. Um, 
And so inherently that's kind of designed to prevent far field R wave oversensing. Um, so we have an initial PVAB blanking period. And then the rest of that is what we would consider PVARP where the atrial channel is alert, but we're not gonna track anything. Um, so that's correct. We wanna really optimize our PVARP setting to limit PMT or what we call pacemaker mediate, mediated tachycardia. Um, so atrial vent falls in PVARP. We're not able to track that because we don't track events in PVARP. And then we allow an intrinsic R wave to come through. We don't buy V pace. And this kind of pattern continues um, throughout the duration of the episode. So because this patient is remotely monitored, we're able to get an alert right away for this. And we can then kind of go into our troubleshooting method and say, what can we adjust here um, to prevent this from happening? Because we want our devices to sense appropriately, obviously. So in terms of reprogramming, um, in these situations, what we'll usually do is we'll call our technical services team at Abbott, and they have a specialized software that they use where they're able actually, or they're able to input the episode that's transmitted to us. And they can kind of run all their sensing parameters and see what can we adjust to prevent this from happening. Um, the reason why we need to call them is because whenever we're adjusting anything with sensitivity on an ICD, we wanna make sure that we're very particular and um, accurate in doing so. We don't wanna risk ever under sensing anything that we wanna sense. So if there's low amplitude VF or um, varying amplitude like polymorphic BT, those present challenges because we wanna be able to sense those appropriately. Um, so we're always gonna be calling tech services in this situation they'll run the episode through their software and then they'll say, okay, this is what you need to adjust. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail on this slide, but if you recall what I mentioned before, we have the ability to customize our sensing settings for post-sensed R wave. So where I'm circling here, and we can also customize post-paste, which I'm circling here. And in this case, I'll go back. This is post-paste. And so we're really gonna hone in on is our post paste RV settings. So where I'm circling. And in this case, tech services said, we're gonna recommend adjusting the post paste decay delay to 125. And then we're gonna adjust our threshold start to 1.3. And I'm gonna go into these terms momentarily here and what they mean. Um, so we brought the patient in, adjusted these settings and that corrected the T wave over sensing. Here's a couple slides on where we actually find this setting on our programmer. Um, so we would go under parameters. We go into our capture and sense highlighted in red. And then in that window, you'll see a little sensibility tab on the bottom right. And then here's where you'll find all of our sensing settings for our ICDs. And then what you see in green is what's changed. So initially it's 95 and one. And now we're recommending going to 125 for our decay delay and our threshold starts gonna go up to 1.3 and we hit program. So now we're gonna kind of step back and talk about sensing in ICDs. Um, as I kind of alluded to before, many signals that are either VF or VT are low amplitude. And so it's a challenge inherently for an ICD to sense appropriately. Um, because we want to sense all those low amplitude signals, but don't oversense anything else. Most commonly T wave oversensing, um, far field oversensing, and you may even see in younger patients, my potential sensing. Um, and so all device manufacturers have a degree of programmability for sensing in their ICDs. Um, Abbott has a little bit more customization available to program different parameters to try to accommodate appropriate sensing. Um, so there's kind of four main things that we talk about when we talk about sensibility, and this is specific to Abbott. Um, we have our threshold start, our decay delay, our max sensitivity, and our refractory periods. 
And the next couple of slides, I'm gonna walk through what each one of those mean and, um, and kind of relate it back to that example that we had just looked at. So first thing that we're gonna talk about is threshold start. So <clears throat> the threshold start is a parameter um, most commonly adjusted first in our ICDs. But to start, I'll just walk you guys through so you can get, ignore the text up top for a second um, if you want to just follow where my mouse is here. So we have our kind of sense channel here. As we know, an R wave is not just one frequency or one amplitude signal. It's kind of a um, multiple different signals that make up an R wave. And so when the device initially starts to sense the initial peak where my mouse is, we start what we call a refractory period. And usually that's 250 milliseconds in ICDs. And essentially the refractory period is just saying, once we start to sense something, we're gonna extend 250 milliseconds. And in that period, we're just gonna take the highest signal or the highest amplitude signal. And we're gonna call that an R wave. And so we see in this example is this peak right here, that's what we're calling our R wave amplitude, even though our R wave kind of extends beyond this period here. Um, and then relating to our threshold start. So threshold start is essentially how high on this R wave peak are we gonna start our decay down for sensing? So again, that can be customized or that can be different for post sense versus post paste. Um, but if you notice in this diagram here, if we have a threshold start of one millivolt, so where my mouse is, that's just saying that we're gonna start our decay right at this point down until our max sensitivity. And if you notice in this case that we actually come across the T wave and given these settings of one millivolt for threshold start, we'll actually over sense the T wave inappropriately. And so in our example before, tech services has said, all right, let's go up to 1.3. So if you see now we're starting a little bit higher on the R wave before we decrement it down. And now we're actually able to kind of bypass the T wave signal and appropriately miss it. And so this is what we want. So we wanna be able to come down over the T wave, anything under this line is what the device doesn't see. It's essentially just the blanked period or, or the blanked uh, signal. Um, so this is threshold start. Kind of summarizing what I just mentioned here by increasing the value to 1.3, we're able to appropriately miss the T wave. Next setting I wanna to touch on is decay delay. So same kind of diagram here. We have our R wave, our refractory period that we initiate. The decay delay is a parameter that kind of starts where our threshold start is. And it's just a delay or a waiting period before we begin to decrement down to our max sensitivity. So if we have a decay delay of zero milliseconds, you'll see that we don't wait at all before we start to decrement down. We'll start our decline right away after we see our R wave. And in this specific example, again, we see that we're sensing the T wave. So this is a problem given this setting. So if we actually bump out the de decay delay to 60 milliseconds, we're waiting 60 milliseconds and then starting to come down. And as you see here that we appropriately miss the T wave by waiting 60 milliseconds. And that's kind of the goal. So. In that example that we showed before, we adjusted decay delay for this exact reason. And then lastly, a kind of our final setting that we can adjust is our max sensitivity. And all our max sensitivity is telling us is what's the floor for sensing? So how low can we go um, sensitivity wise? It's usually either 0.5 millivolts or 0.3 millivolts in our ICDs. Um, and so thresholds, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of put all put it all together. And I think the next slide does that, but threshold start starting at this level on the R wave, decay delay. And then now we're gonna come down 
until we reach either the next sensed R wave. So if we had a PVC, for example, that came in right here, that would reset our sensing um, as long as it was appropriately sensed above our sensing level. Um, so we'd come down until we either send something else or we heat or we hit our max sensitivity. Most commonly, you'll hit your max sensitivity and then you'll kind of just wait for your next R wave to come through and that'll just restart this whole process. One thing to note is this slope or line of decay is not programmable in our devices. We can program a lot of other things, but this kind of slope down is just nominal um, and it can't be adjusted. And so this is a nice slide that puts it all together. So I'll start left to right here. So we have our R wave, we initiate our refractory period, about 250 milliseconds nominally in our ICDs. And then we are using our peak, the R wave to start our threshold start. So our setting here for our threshold start is one millivolt. So right where my mouse is, is where the device is gonna start its sensing. So we're waiting 95 milliseconds for our decay delay. And then we're gonna start to decline down to the max sensitivity. And you notice, oh, we hit a T wave. So this is problematic. We oversense the T wave. We come down to the max sensitivity. We initiate that whole cycle again. So we have our refractory. Now, if you notice in the second R wave, we have different settings compared to the first. So we're starting a little bit higher with our threshold start. So we're now at 1.3 compared to one, and we're waiting an additional 30 milliseconds to start our decline down. And you notice here that we actually missed the T wave appropriately. Um, so this is kind of a nice summarizing screen that shows inappropriate sensing in the T wave. We adjust some parameters and now we can appropriately sense or not sense the T wave. Um, I'll kind of pause here before I get into our next case study, um, but definitely opening it up to any questions on what was going on. I could go back to the EGM if AJ, if you want to um, ask any questions for yourself. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think this is really great uh, to run through this and the, the side by side examples is really helpful. Um, so if you have any questions, please reach out in the chat. But my initial reactions here, I mean, one thing I wanted to to, uh, to reconfirm is, is this is not a dynamic algorithm, right? So um, if you're seeing T-wave oversensing, this is something where you'll have to actually physically bring the patient in and make the required changes, and then you won't have to, to deal with that anymore. Um, so it's it's not something where the device knows to, uh, to go ahead and make these changes itself. Um, but we're always here to help through these processes. We're happy to engage. You know, you can reach out to tech services directly or reach out to us for things where we actually have to um, run it through a backend algorithm. It's usually better to have tech services advice on this. But um, no, I think this is really good. And people may ask, well, why does this matter? You know, the real impact here is we're trying to get as sensitive as possible without double counting, without interrupting our ability to interpret what's really going on in the heart. Um, before traditional devices would just have a max sensitivity and you would have to set your max sensitivity above your T wave. So if you have a two millivolt T wave, then you're not getting sensitive enough to pick up fine VF possibly. You're not, you know, you're gonna under sense torsades and may sense that as a normal rhythm. And this patient could very well be in a shockable uh, deadly arrhythmia that just goes undetected. So that's that's why you know, these these um, vendor specific algorithms and everyone has their own different things to to um, locate, find VF or to find these um, events is, is really impactful and important versus the traditional things. And, you know, you don't see it in pacemakers. You don't you're not as concerned, right? You under sense in a pacemaker, you over pace and it could be pro rhythmic. But in general, you know, it's better to pace in a dependent patient than to not. But in ICDs, that's when it becomes a whole different ball game of like, you have to be um, as sensitive as possible without oversensing, without exposing them to undue risk of shock. Any questions from the group at all? Nothing so far. I think we're good to plow Andrew. on though. Oh yeah, Andrew, sorry. Can I, just, can I just quickly ask you, mate, um, is that uh, threshold start, is that a percentage of the R wave or is it always a fixed number? So, that's a good question. So in our 
um, the one millivolt. So this, this is a fixed amount. So it's just one millivolt above baseline. Um, distinguishing between, I'll come back to our slide here. Um, so whether it's post sensed for an R wave or post paste, that will kind of distinguish if it's going to be a fixed millivolt value or percentage. Um, and so we see with our post sensed sensing settings, so where I'm circling with my mouse, that's actually a percentage. So that in this case, whatever our wave would measure, say it would measure four millivolts, we would start our threshold start 50% of that. Um, so in our post sense setting, it's a little more dynamic in terms of where we're starting as opposed to our post paste threshold start where it's just going to be a fixed value above baseline. Um, did that answer your question? Perfect, mate. What, That's really good. Thank you. One, one comment too, just while we're on that subject, it's it takes it off of six millivolts, correct, is the maximum? for correct. like yeah, the so percentage. Exactly. Yeah, so for an R wave, say we measured an R wave at 10 millivolts um, because that's such a high value, the device will kind of set an upper limit at, even though the R wave is measuring 10, we're going to start with it kind of in quotations being a six millivolt R wave. So that way we can still appropriately have all of our uh, subsequent settings come into play. Um, so the maximum sense, that, yeah, the maximum sense in these three millivolts is what you're saying when it's sensing. It'll never go above three millivolts. Is that what you're suggesting? If it's programmed to fifty percent, yeah, if it's programmed yeah, to seventy five percent, yeah, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and then similar when we talk about the atrium, we do have the ability to have this same dynamic sensing in the atrium. Although historically we usually don't do that, we'll just keep a, a fixed sensing at like 0.5 millivolts in the atrium. But if we have a P wave greater than three millivolts, it kind of follows the same rule where we're not gonna go beyond that for our starting point for threshold start. It'll just use that uh, or three millivolts is kind of the upper barrier for the atrium, six millivolts for the R wave in the ventricle. And then one other point I want to mention here, just because it's in front of me, is you can actually on Abbott devices um, disassociate the pacer and the ventricular defib. Um, so if you have a patient who's dependent and you're worried about over sensing, you can then uh, make the sensitivity much higher or make it less sensitive in the pacer. So it's more likely to pace, but without making any big drastic changes to the defib. Um, so you can still make sure you're pacing when you need to pace, but you're as sensitive as you need to be for um, defib. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, one more thing I kind of wanted to touch on too that you may see, which is kind of interesting, is if we look at under our defib settings here for sensing, um, we see our kind of our max sensitivity shown at 0. 0.5 at 110 beats per minute. Um, so that's ideally what you want to see. That's just saying that once we get into a rate above 110 or beyond, because the rate is so fast, the max sensitivity for the device is going to be set at 0.5, which in this case is what we want. You could potentially see a situation where you have your max sensitivity set at 0.5, but because there's some other parameters adjusted that aren't nominal with sensing, it may say 0.5. 8 is our actual max sensitivity at 110 beats per minute. And the reason why that happens is because maybe we had previously adjusted our threshold start in the past because we had T wave over sensing. Because we're adjusting the way we're starting our sensing algorithm, the device may not be able to get down to its max sensitivity because we kind of adjusted other settings um, to correct T wave over sensing to maybe uh, correct my potential over sensing. So although you have your floor set at 0.5, if other things are adjusted, you may be limited to getting down to maybe 0.7 or 0.8. Um, and that's just kind of normal device behavior. And so if you see a kind of a mismatch here that alerts you that something else is probably adjusted, that's limiting us from getting to the most sensitive part or most sensitive level, if that makes sense. Perfect. Yeah, if you want to plow on to the next segment. Yeah. So we're going to kind of switch gears for our next 
case study. Um, so this one we're going to talk about AMS. What's AMS? Does anyone want to take a stab at what that acronym means? I'll give it away. Atrial mode switch. Um, so in this case study, we're going to be focusing on a pacemaker as opposed to the last one we were looking at, an ICD. Um, so a little bit about the patient background here. So we had a 73-year-old female. She had a pacer received or, or put in for sick sinus. Um, typically active, but as of late, she wasn't feeling well, feeling a little fatigued, um, loss of energy. So we brought her into the office, um, interrogated her device, and we noticed that there was kind of an increase in her AF burden um, discovered on a recent remote transmission. And so the question was, you know, do we want to cardiovert this patient if they're having an elevated AF burden? And if we take a deeper dive into some of our diagnostics here at the bottom, I know there's a lot here, um, but just going to focus on what I highlighted. Um, so if you see on the left, there's a ton of AMS episodes stored since April of 22, um, almost 15,000. And then if you look on the right, we see um, kind of a rise in our AF burden. So this uh, diagram on the right shows you the last year, and it just shows you the burden um, as a function of percent of time. So we see there's a kind of a steep elevation. And so that indicates, all right, this patient may be having some sort of atrial arrhythmia, whether that's AF um, or flutter. And so next step is, all right, let's take a look at some of the episodes stored on the device and see what's going on. So we do just that. And so this is a snippet of one of the episodes stored on the device. Um, so to start, I'll just orient ourselves again to what we're looking at. So we have our atrial sense channel up top. That's our first column or first uh, row, sorry. Um, so this is what the atrial lead is seeing here. Down below, we have our V-Sense amp, so that's what our RV lead is seeing. And then down below is our marker channel, so that's just letting us know what the device is interpreting and what's going on with the uh, um, device function. So question for the group, is there any idea as to why the device is kind of falling in and out of our mode switch? So you see our AMS marker on the marker channel where my mouse is. And then we see that we exit a mode switch here for a couple seconds. And then we actually come back into one. And does anyone have an idea on maybe what's going on here? So if we want to kind of just take a look at the atrial channel first, um, it looks like we're in some sort of atrial arrhythmia. Um, to me, this looks like it could be a flutter. It looks pretty consistent. Um, the rate also would be indicative of a flutter as opposed to atrial fibrillation, which we would expect to be a little faster. Um, so it looks like we're maybe in a two to one flutter. Um, it looks like the patient's conducting on their own to start. We have our V senses coming through, um, but I'll open the floor. Does anyone have an idea on what's going on or any initial thoughts on this episode? So one of the thoughts from the group was uh, far field oversensing. And um, while I agree, this is probably a flutter here. I can definitely see where you would, where you would guess maybe far field, just looking at it, those that flutter happens to perfectly align with the ventricular events, right? So every other atrial event lines up with that ventricular event. And if this, if we didn't have the rest of the strip with, um, the pacing episodes and things like that, that could definitely lead me to believe this is a flutter as well. But um, I agree with what you said, Andrew, that this is probably a, sorry, the, I would agree with what was said in the group. This could be far, far field over sensing, but I agree with what you're saying here, Andrew, this is a, looks like an atrial flutter. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very fair point to start. Um, I would agree. It looks like all of our atrial events here are falling right in line with this R wave sense. Mm -hmm. Um, something that could be helpful to look at is as we start to pace in the subsequent couple beats here, um, we don't maybe see as close of a response on the far field channel, um, given it is a paced R wave. So it probably 
the, the polarization is a little bit different going through the ventricle, but if we follow up a V pace, it doesn't align as we would expect if mm -hmm. it was a far field with the, with the pace. Um, yeah, you, you can really see that around the nine second mark yeah, just so before that. You see yeah. the V pace doesn't align with the... Yeah, there's definitely some separation. So that's another clue that can let us know that maybe there's something else going on in the atrium, but very fair assumption to start just looking at this initial three to four seconds. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you could say, though, is in line with that thought process is that what's actually happening is the opposite of this is that the atrial events are falling into ventricular refractory so the device is in what's called postventricular atrial blanking so the ventricular event occurs with the v sense it tells the atrium to close its eyes to avoid far field oversensing um, by design but as a result this flutter and the idiosyncrasy of the flutter is aligning with the ventricular sense it's closing its eyes in the atrium, it's blanking it completely, and it's causing us to undersense an atrial flutter, which causes it to mode switch initially, and then fall back out of mode switch. That is correct. Um, so, just, I mean, just taking a step back, like these devices that we work with are very smart. The algorithms are very complex, um, but essentially they're going to do what we program them to do. Um, so if the device is programmed a certain way, it's going to just kind of follow its commands and just act accordingly. Um, there's a lot of programmability, as you saw with these devices, but um, it's important that we program them effectively um, so that way they can kind of act or, or give us optimal function. Um, so kind of walking through this strip here, we notice there's definitely some differences between our marker channels. So we're, as AJ was mentioning, we're starting in a mode switch um, and then we're inappropriately ending and then we're back into a mode switch. Um, does anyone know what these ARs are on the marker channel? So where my mouse is, these kind of black boxes that have an AR shown. Um, can't really see the chat, but those ARs just, oh, did somebody come off? Oh yeah, I was just going to say the, uh, they're just, a, they're falling in the PVAP as the, as, a, as opposed to the other ones are probably falling in the uh, PVAP. Correct. That is 100% accurate. So these events here that you're seeing in a box are falling in our alert period, our PVARP alert period. So the device is seeing them, they're contributing to our AMS algorithm. Um, but we're not going to track anything that's found in PBAR. Um, these couple of beats preceding, we see all these atrial events that aren't seen, and we don't see any sort of refractory marker on the atrial channel. Um, and so those events are falling in the first part of PBAR that we call PBAB, where the atrial channel completely closes its eyes, doesn't want to see anything. Um, so in two to one flutter, you could run into some sensing challenges with appropriately mode switching because the rates are so regular um, that the device will just naturally blank essentially every other flutter wave. Um, and so when we see something like this and it's consistent, we definitely need to adjust our, some settings um, because obviously the goal here is we want to have an accurate understanding of what the patient has, um, what their burden is for AF or flutter, um, especially if we're going to be starting any sort of um, you know, medication to try to address this, or if we're thinking about cardioversion, we really need to have an accurate understanding of how their burden is and how it's trending over time. And so because we're not effectively diagnosing flutter in this situation, we're missing out on that burden, which could then falsely let us know that, hey, maybe this patient doesn't have the amount of flutter that we thought they did. Um, let's not cardiovert in, when in reality, we would probably want to address this with this patient, um, especially if they're feeling symptomatic, um, lethargic, all that stuff that we had kind of talked about initially with the patient description. So recapping what we talked about with flutter, have a tendency to fall into blanking. So all these events that you're seeing on the atrial channel are falling into our blanking period. We're not seeing them. 
as I mentioned, anything falling in VVAB is invisible. So the device doesn't see it, can't store any data on it, or can't contribute to any sort of mode switch. Um, and then just kind of a little bit of a side note. So in our Abbott devices, we have what we call FARI. It's our filtered atrial rate interval. And so all this interval or all this rate is kind of letting us know is, is it's counting all the events in the atrium that are either sensed, so an atrial sensed event, or an event that's falling into refractory. And it kind of stores a log of all these events. And it uses FARI to eventually make the decision, all right, we're going to mode switch now once the FARI interval surpasses a rate that we program on the device. So anomaly will have the mode switch rate maybe be at 180 beats per minute. And that's just letting us know that once that atrial interval exceeds 180 beats per minute, the device will then mode switch into a non-tracking mode um, because we don't want to track any sort of fast atrial arrhythmia in the ventricle. And so we go into a mode where we're just going to kind of be focusing on the ventricle until the atrial arrhythmia subsides and we can then go back to our normal DDD mode or whatever mode the patient's programmed in. Um, and that kind of just jumped the gun a little bit with FARI. Um, so it's just monitoring that P2P -P interval. Um, it takes account events that fall into PVARP but not blanking. So that's why we can potentially delay our ability to mode switch if events fall into blanking. Um, just PVARP is what FARI is looking at. And then, as I mentioned before, we have our, what we call our atrial tachycardia detection rate highlighted in yellow here. Normally it's 180 on pacemakers, um, but all this rate lets us know is that as the atrial rate increases, FARI increases. When FARI exceeds 180 beats per minute, the device is gonna mode switch. Um, and so this atrial detection rate is programmable. Um, and that kind of segments me into my next discussion here. So this just shows you all of our events exceeding the track rate or the atrial detection rate. And now we go from a DDD mode to now a non-tracking DDI or VVI, depending on what the device is set at. Um, Again, why don't these atrial events that you see here count towards FARI? That's because they're falling into blanking. Um, and so I'll pose this question to the group. So we see this episode, we now understand we're in a two to one flutter, events are falling into blanking. Does anyone have an idea of what we can change programming wise to correct this problem? There's kind of two things that we could usually do when we run into this situation. I'm assuming we could shorten the PVAP, perhaps. Correct. So more that events is... following the PVAP and allowing Fari to work. That is 100% correct. To kind of play devil's advocate, what's the limitation to shortening PVAP? Like, what do we have to be concerned about when we start to shorten the blanking period? Yeah, like PMTs and far field and things like that. Correct. Appropriate mode switching. Exactly. So in this situation, shortening blanking is exactly what we'd want to do, but we have to then just be a little bit more concerned about we kind of open up the potential for far field R wave over sensing now, which is kind of would lead you into pretty much the opposite problem. In that situation, you would be inappropriately mode switching because you're sensing all the far field R wave events. And FARI is going to think those are either flutter or fib waves, and we're going to inappropriately mode switch. And in that case, the patient's going to have an AF burden elevated. That is not true. Um, so there's kind of two sides to that. So you got to be just careful on shortening blanking. You could theoretically open the door for far field oversensing. Um, but in this case, that's exactly right. So the main thing that we're going to want to adjust is our PVAB period. And the thought process behind that is we just want to be able to see all those atrial events to allow us to mode switch more effectively. And then I guess the other option is uh, lower the ATDR, the anti-tachycardial detection rate from Correct. what's yep. nominal, like 180 to 160 or 
Yeah, so nominal is 180. Yeah. So what, it, so what AJ just alluded to was this rate that we see here in yellow. We can actually lower that. And when we lower that, it's kind of just setting the bar a little lower for our atrial rate. So rather than the device mode switching with an atrial rate at 180, we can then adjust it to maybe 150 or 160. Mm. So it makes it a little less sensitive um, um, to fast atrial rate, or more sensitive, sorry, to fast atrial rates, um, which the, could then speed up the process to mode switch. So in this example, that's exactly what we're doing. We're actually going to do both. So first thing we're going to do is going to decrease, uh, sorry, decrease PVAB. So kind of walking through where we'd find that on an Abbott programmer. Under parameters, you would go into the refractories and blanking box. And then we see here that we're set nominal at 150. And in this case, we adjusted down to 100. So we shortened that blanking period by 50 milliseconds with the thought of now we're able to appropriately sense those flutter waves that were previously falling in blanking. And then second thing, as I just kind of mentioned before, is we can decrease that atrial tachycardia detection rate. And where we'd find that is under our AF response. We have our um, mode switch mode there. We have our detection rate, and then we have our base rate. So right now our ATDR is set at 180. I think we could afford to go down to maybe 150. So this makes it a little bit more, um, a little easier for the device to mode switch with these new settings. And we should now have a much more accurate idea of what's going on with this patient from an AF standpoint. Now the device is able to kind of diagnose everything appropriately. So kind of posing a question here, um, is our patient really having a thousand short episodes? Um, I would say probably not. They're probably a lot longer than we initially thought they were. Um, would we want to cardiovert this patient? Probably. Um, they're probably having a lot longer episodes of atrial flutter. Um, and due to that initial programming, they were just functionally under sensing. Um, and we weren't able to accurately depict what was going on in the atrium because of that. And so this kind of summarizes what I mentioned before. Most likely those episodes that we were seeing were kind of a short um, snapshot of a longer flutter episode that was not stored. Um, so I would say, yes, we'll probably cardiovert this patient um, because we now have a better idea of that their burden is probably a lot higher. Any other feedback or discussion on this specific case study? Um, Can you go question, back? Andrew, if that's our, oh, sorry, man. you go, AJ. Oh, no, no, uh, Jared, go ahead. I was just going to ask you if you could just uh, specifically just explain to the guys out there, with, especially with Abbott, the, why you would choose DDD, or DDI over VVI for mode switch. What's the advantages of one over the other? Do we lose our atrial counting when we're in VVI during mode switch? So DDI, uh, you don't you don't lose your atrial, um, I guess marker or counter in VVI. Um, the device is still looking at the atrial interval because we, essentially we want to be able to effectively exit a mode switch. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the device is VVI, it's still running far in the background, looking at is the atrial rate slowing down? Can we then exit the mode switch? Um, but an interesting kind of point on the DDI VVI discussion is <clears throat> in a patient that we have longer AV delays programmed in, if we have their mode switch rate be DDI, um, you could potentially pace the atrium fast because as we extend out our paced AV delay, we're actually shortening that interval from the from V to A in DDI timing. And so we can essentially then pace the atrium in a mode switch a lot faster than we would ideally want to with longer AV delays. So what we kind of do with programming is if we have a, a pace AV delay of 250, for example, probably more beneficial to go VVI for our mode switch mode. So that way we don't potentially introduce inappropriate atrial pacing 
in a mode switch, which could then theoretically um, maybe it accelerate an atrial flutter or an atrial arrhythmia. Um, so that's kind of an, another insight on DDI, VDI, but I think nominal is DDI, right? AJ for pacemakers with Abbott I think, LED. Yeah, nominal should be DDI. And I think it really, that's a really good point you brought up. Um, when you have a sensor driven rate, that's when it becomes really problematic. Um, if you're set DDI R with long AV delays in a ventricular based timing, like DDI R is, what can actually happen is you can pace above the max sensor rate. So the MSR may be 120 and the device could be pacing a patient at 130 or even faster because of the idiosyncrasy of a long AV delay. Um, so that is when I'd always say VVIR. But I think, Jared, to answer your question, I think the only advantage is really if they kind of sputter in and out of AFib. So they have like AFib enough to stay in mode switch, but they have pauses. Pause, yeah. Yeah, then you have atrial pacing for a period of time. How much that actually helps the patient, I don't know. I don't know if there's another reason, Andrew, for it, really. I would think uh, along the lines of what you were just saying, if you needed atrial, I mean, that's the main difference. With DDI, you're going to have atrial pacing. So if you needed um, intermittent pacing while the patient maybe was in and out of a flutter or fib, mm -hmm. you would theoretically have that with DDI programming. Um I honestly can't think of another reason why you would, you know, choose DDI over VVI um, aside from that, that reason. But that's a good question for sure. Um, well, uh, one thing, can you go back to yeah. the, uh, to the tree for me? Uh, the, the marker channel tree, one that is relatively large. This one. So one thing, yeah. And you might've already explained this. Um, I was just checking on other things, but one thing I want to point out, I don't know if you can see my annotation here, but that guy there, can you see my drawing? Uh, can you see a drawing, an arrow I just pointed? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that guy there, uh, the the thick black line there, that's the PVAB. And then the thinner line here, that is your PVARP timing. So um, yeah, I mean, it's great to look at the, um, at the programmer and say 150 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, but it's also really useful if you have this, as you can say, okay, why did this one not fall into blanking? Well, if you draw this line down from this atrial event, it falls just outside of the PVAB timing. I know I drew a sideways line, but it does yeah. versus this one that's truly blanked. If you follow it straight down, it's within the PVAB. So that's why it's completely blanked. Um, so I think it's it's always useful to look at your marker channels and just know that the thick lines are times that that channel is completely blind. The thin lines are times that that channel is in a relative refractory period where it can still sense. Um, so if you look at the ventricular channel on the inverse, this thick line here indicates that the ventricular channel is blind for that period of time while while this is occurring. So I, I, marker channels are helpful, I think, to visualize the the numbers that you see on the programmer is all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I would 100% agree with that. And also you could kind of, as you mentioned, um, either use calipers on the programmer or just visually count some of these small boxes to see what do we need to adjust our PVAP setting to mm -hmm. um, using these kind of helpful tools with the, you know, seeing visually what the blanking period is, where is the event falling? Is it falling 20 milliseconds outside of blanking? Is it falling 60 milliseconds outside of blanking? Mm -hmm. um, so you can definitely just look at the episode on the programmer and count boxes if needed. And then you can kind of make your programming adjustment from that. But good point there. I, I think this really, you know, I mean, obviously this is Abbott heavy, but, you know, these concepts apply to, to every pacemaker, right? I mean, we every pacemaker has PVARP, has PVAB. Um, so when you're seeing it, you know, in the field, when you're studying for the IBHRE, these these are core commonalities around it. So I think it's important to learn the uh, the basic structure, and then we can always talk you through the individual programmer with one of our experts. But I think it's really important to understand what PVAB is, what PVARP is, why these devices are acting the way they're acting. As Andrew said, these are very intelligent, dumb devices. They know what they know based on the inputs they receive. And if you don't like the output, there's probably something wrong with the input. 
So, um, Jared, I don't know if you have any, you know, I mean, you, you work with everything here. Uh, yeah. Do you have any recommendations on, you know, Abbott or Medtronic or anything like that? No, like I, like you said, mate, I think there, there's much of a muchness when it comes to this kind of thing. I think with a lot of the uh, Brady devices, um, just a little little take home message for everyone listening. What what I get all my students to do, um, especially when teaching pacing, is there was a comment before where we were questioning whether this was a bit of a, perhaps far field R wave on the atrial trunnel and not actually an atrial flutter. A thing I get all my guys to do is when the patient's in clinic is do a VA conduction test. So I get them to pace the ventricle in VVI and see if we do have VA conduction. Um, if the answer is yes, then you've got to, then you have a, you know, you're questioning, okay, well, is this an atrial tachycardia or is this just sinus rhythm with VA conduction? Um, if they don't have VA conduction, then it, it means labeling episodes like this a lot easier as an atrial tachycardia. Because you know a lot of these, if the patient does not have VA conduction, then this can only be an atrial tachycardia. Um, very rarely it's going to be far field R wave over sensing, because if it is, you're going to see that in sinus rhythm anyway. So you would know even in sinus rhythm whether this patient has far field R wave over sensing. So in this particular episode, if you knew the patient didn't have VA conduction, then you can pretty much be very confident this is going to be an atrial tachycardia. Does that make sense? That's a great point. No, that's dead on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually, so what I was planning on covering today kind of went over, you know, um, VA conduction as well as uh, far R, but I think we're also kind of getting pressed for time here. So I don't want to take up too much more of everyone's time with a whole nother presentation. So maybe we just focus on, on this here. Uh, anything else that, any other points you have? Um, no, I mean, just kind of reiterate what you were saying. Um, try to keep these two examples um, broad. So aside, you know, whether it's Abbott, Medtronic, Biotronic, these concepts are very universal. With, as AJ mentioned, PVAR, PBAB, T-wave over sensing, you, you'll see, um, you know, it could be metabolic. Maybe the patient um, has some sort of metabolic abnormality with the peak T-wave. Um, and so kind of just going off that discussion for a second, if we see a patient has T wave over sensing and it's transient, or maybe it's occurring one time, it's worth having a discussion, you know, is this something that we want to just monitor for now? Um, as opposed to making the device less sensitive to VF and VT. Um, usually if it's a recurring thing and we're getting a million episodes, it's something that we either want to address with the, the programmer with the device and you know, making a change, or there's plenty of times that maybe the patient has um, hyperpotassium where their T wave or, or, or T wave was just elevated. Um, and so it can be addressed metabolically. Um, so that's just kind of another kind of uh, thing you may run into where if you see T wave over sensing, not to just jump immediately at reprogramming the device to make it less sensitive maybe look at the bigger picture as to what's going on. Is it transient? Is it happening frequently? What's the patient's background? Because everyone's different. That's usually what we do here. Um, and we work, you know, closely with the clinics, closely with the EPs to kind of discover those answers to those questions. Um, because the, the last thing we would do would be to make the device less sensitive. I think there's certain things that we would address before um, because again, ICDs, we, we need to sense low amplitude signals. Um, so we're always very hesitant to make it less sensitive. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point is, is taking account like the holistic aspects of it. Is it, the device is seeing this, but is, is a T wave over sensing an issue of this is a normal T wave or is there something else going on? Um, actually, Jared, I'd, I'd love to kind of get your opinion on this because I think, you know, you run the the clinic there and you you work in the lab itself as well. So if you have a patient that gets flagged for like a longer QT or things like that, what would be your initial uh, steps from your perspective? Not to put yeah, you on the spot question. here. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, no, it's got the brain ticking. Um, I think if you're in the lab doing an implant and you're picking up T-Wave, then it's a tricky one. Um, you got to, yeah, I mean, the first thing you do 
I guess first and foremost, you've got to try and alleviate the situation immediately, try and avoid T-wave overstension, as we've spoken about today, because we know the consequences uh, can be bad. Um, but in terms of long QT, when it's a, a, if the you know something like that, if it's a, a pathology issue, then I don't know if there's much around it apart from reaching out to the experts like yourselves and uh, seeing how we're going to be able to program around it. Um, because really, you know, unless you can, you know, unless you sort out the drugs and try and shorten the QT interval, um, I can't see much much way around it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I guess I was kind of more leaning towards that that question, right? And obviously, it's a case by case basis, but I mean, what from my mindset is very siloed in the device, and I think that. Um, you know, unfortunately for the people in the field here, you know, you're you're not dealing just with the device, but you're also dealing with the patient medical management and all these other things. So it's, um, you know, it's not just stopping at, you know, why is a device oversensing T waves, but what's the implication of having a long QT, for example. So this could be a way to, to early recognize a longer QT and maybe run an EKG, look for any kind of abnormalities. Has has the situation changed with this patient? Yeah, that's perfect, man. Definitely. And we, and we know that um, people may present with a short QT, but certain drugs can lengthen the QT. So this is mm -hmm. this is a, uh, yeah, it's not a one-stop fix all. Uh, you mm -hmm. really got to monitor and treat every individual very differently. Especially with drug changes, you know, a lot of people who have ICDs may then go on to have, you know, a lot of optimized medical management, which can, you know, cause a lot of, um, you know, a lot of changes metabolically. So you've mm -hmm. got to be very careful with that, how that then changes the ECG and then how it, that changes the way the device is sensing. So it's, uh, yeah, quite important that if there are big medical changes um, with medical management, then, yeah, definitely a, a device check should probably follow soon after. Perfect. That's, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's dead on. Thank you for giving our perspective there. Yeah, uh, I would agree with what you said, AJ, as well. Like we, as device guys, like we just look at what what can we do on the device sometimes and we kind of get very, uh, have tunnel vision essentially. So mm -hmm. it's important to kind of take a step back and say, is it something that can be addressed beyond the device first? Um, sometimes it's hard to do that because we like just playing around with the devices and programming, <laughs> but it's definitely important to uh, see the see the big picture perfect so we did have one question from the group uh would it be possible to have an af egm for today uh actually as luck would have it we still have to go over last week's question that i posed to the group so um i don't know andrew if you want to you want to stop sharing here yeah and then i'll hop on and really quick i'm going to pull this up here um so i set this out to the group the other day and I'm just trying to make sure I have it. Give me one second here. I don't know if you want to sing for him while I pull this up, keep them entertained. Okay, got it. So let me share my screen. Okay, so we shared this group the other day. Um, and the original questions are, what rhythm is the patient in? What type of device is used in this example? Is this SVT or VT? Was the shock appropriate? Was the shock, shock successful at terminating the tachycardia? Uh, why did the device switch from SVT to VF diagnosis? What do the tick marks mean? Did the ATP capture? And what is the minimum morphology match score for this episode? I know that was a lot of questions, but like just off the top here. So what rhythm is the patient in? You would ask for an AFib eGM. Here you go. I would say this is most likely AFib. I mean, it could be noise, but I'd say it's most likely AFib. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, Andrew, do you want to take a crack at what rhythm they are in? I know yeah. I'm putting you on the spot here, man. No, no, it's, it's all good. Um, I mean, so I, I kind of look, when I look at this, I look right at the uh, far field discrimination channel, and I'm looking at the morphology of that R wave and it looks very narrow. Um, so if I were to suspect it's originating in, in the ventricle, I would expect to see it a little wider. Um, and a kind of nice thing to actually look at in this example is if you look at when we actually start to deliver ATP, 
And we see how that morphology changes significantly because now we're pacing the ventricle and we see it's a lot wider. So I would expect to see something looking like that if it was driven by the ventricle, if it was like a VT or VF. But you see the you know subsequent beats before and after the ATP look very narrow. Um, so I would say it's probably AF with just a rapid conducted ventricular rate. Um, the intervals as well mm -hmm. look pretty inconsistent. Um, we would expect it to be a little more consistent with uh, a VT. Um, and then I think to kind of answer one of the questions that you had uh, had maybe said as to why the device switched to a VF diagnosis, um, it, it definitely looks like there's probably some intermittent undersensing on the atrial channel because it looks like very fine AFib. Um, and so this is kind of going to another discussion potentially for next time, but when we diagnose an episode on our devices, the first thing that we characterize is, are there more events on the A? Are there more on the V? And based on what bucket that falls into, we have a whole line of discriminators that accommodate each situation. And so the devices are programmed to work where if there's less atrial events than ventricular events, the device is automatically going to diagnose that as VT or VF because when we think about that, if we're having more events on the v coming from the ventricle compared to the atrium, we're going to immediately think that's VF. But you could run into a situation where I think we kind of see it here is that you, you're under sensing on the atrial channel. You're falsely telling the device, hey, there's more V events than A events. This is VF or VT. When in reality, it's just under sensing on the atrial channel. And if we were appropriately sensing, we would completely shift our discriminator uh, kind of cadence of what we're discriminating to a whole different branch. Um, that, may, that may have been a little too much info for that, but that was, that was my insight on that. No, so I think that's uh, really insightful. There's I, there's a couple things that I, you don't have the information, so you don't know. So I'll show you this in a second. But I think you pointed out the really important facts. Like, what are we looking for when we're looking at SVT versus VT? And a uh, big one is interval stability, right? So here, I don't. you can see my mouse, correct? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, here you can see, obviously, this interval is quite different from this interval, um, is quite different from this one. So the intervals are relatively unstable, dead on with morphology. You can't trust an EGM necessarily to tell you what the EKG looks like or what the actual you know QRS would look like on an EKG, but you can a lot of times tell a far-field EGM. So this discriminator channel is a far-field, right? It's a coil to can vector. Um, so it's going across the RV all the way to the can itself. Um, and it will give you a surrogate of an EKG, and you can see morphologically wide versus narrow. And here we have what we would almost expect a VT to look like when you pace. And then here you have um, morphologically narrow complex, which means it's originating either very, very high in the ventricle, like a junctional kind of rhythm, or it's originating supraventricular, um, you know, like a uh, conducting down. Um, in this case, the interval stability indicates it. Morphologically, you look at your morphology score. Here, these little check marks mean that it matches the morphology of what it thinks an intrinsic to look like. This 93 means it's a 93% match. Um, keep in mind aberrancy. So aberrant conduction at high rates can cause uh, morphology to look different. That can trick morphology score, but this is dead on saying, hey, no, this looks like intrinsic to me or pretty close to it. So the device is saying, Everything I think, this is a an SVT, but for some reason it intervenes. Uh, you're looking at A's versus V's. I think that's a really good assessment. Uh, the problem is this device is going off of um, uh, this is going off ventricular only, so it's not actually taking into account oh, okay. the atrial channel. Um, what it's actually saying here, though, it's just going off of morphology and is going off interval stability. Both are saying it's SVT, but it's set to 214 beats a minute. Um, this rate, I mean, this event that it calls FIB is 225. So you take 60,000 divided by 266 and it's like 225. Um, so it has just exceeded the VF detection zone. And when you're in VF detection, the device says you're going too fast. I'm not going to say whether or not it's SVT or VT. 
I'm going to shock. This is a prime example of, you know, the made it, um, the made it programming 171, 200. If we had used this standard programming, or in this case, this was even 214, this patient gets shocked. If you use the newer adopted programming that was recommended by HRS guidelines, where you have like a 230 max cutoff rate for um, SVT discriminators, and we I'll send that back out again today. Um, it has recommendations for every device. Um, this may have avoided a shock that was inappropriate. In this case, it did not. They were shocked. Um, so questions here, was a shock appropriate? I would say no. This is AFib with RVR, and they received a 30-joule shock. Was the shock successful? Nope. Was ATP successful? Morphologically, I would say yes, right? It looks like we are capturing here. Um, why did the device switch from SVT to VF? Uh, because it was uh, exceeded the tacky detection rate for VF. Um, Jared, you want to take this one if you're if you're around. Uh, what do the tick marks mean on the marker channel at all? Yeah, man. Yeah. So uh, as you can see here, so we know when we do a morphology template at implant, we're checking the intrinsic, uh, what the intrinsic uh, morphology looks like based on what the lead thinks it is. So mm -hmm. we do that at implant and we do it at each follow up. And, um, and anything that has a tick tells you that the device thinks that this matches the intrinsic rhythm suggesting mm. that this is not not a ventricular arrhythmia. It supports an SVT. 100%. It's interesting too, uh, if you see here, this check mark means it, it matches, right? This X means it failed right here. And then if you look at the score, it's 86. If you go up here to see what our morphology rating was, it says it has to be greater than 90%. So I think that's a really good point, Jared, is that like these ticks are a good way to see what the device said. This one didn't match. I'd say it's probably just aberrant, you know, conduction. Um, same thing. These, that's just a um, redetection. interval. Yeah, yeah, redetection. I don't know if it, does it even do morphology score during detection? I guess it should be. I don't, I don't believe so. No, I think it's just strictly rate-based for redetection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess morphology, it probably just says morphology out the window. At, in the VF zone, it's not a redetection. I guess it's VF, right? Because it's committed. Yeah, I think I think by that Either point, way. it's already it's already made its mind up. So I don't think morphology is relevant at that point because it's already detected as an arrhythmia. Yeah, so you can yeah. Add, um, just to kind of go off of that. I, I think after the stim of our initial mm -hmm. VF therapy, mm -hmm. the device still considers that as a first kind of treatment. So prior to actually delivering the shock, we still need to mm -hmm. have six fast beats redetected. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you can have, so say we stim here and the, the rhythm actually slow down or the AFib kind of calm down. Mm -hmm. If we had six consecutive V sense or V paces mm -hmm. while we're charging, the device would then say, all right, we actually return to sinus here. I'm going to abort the charge and just bleed off all the um, voltage in the capacitor. So even after the stim, I think we still have to redetect and it could theoretically back out of the charge, essentially, um, if it detects V-Sense events after the ATP, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, and I think it's good you brought up the V-Sense. So, you know, the way these these dashes work, uh, this means it fell within the tacky group. This means it was kind of between V-Sense and tacky, judging from the timing. This vSense meant the timing, it's taking the average and the interval average. So it's not just this event, but it's, is there an argument between the average of the last four plus this current interval? And in this point, they disagree. This point, the interval average and the average agree. I know this is kind of complicated. We can always go through, I think we've talked about it before, but we're happy to talk about it again. Um, and the reason why these exist is to kind of smooth it out, right? So you're not just going off of each interval, but you're also taking into account a more aggregate of the last four intervals as well. So in this case, you know, we have fib, 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 fib. These, the interval average, the last four average plus this current interval, both agree that it's in the fib zone. You have this long gap here where this interval is actually probably in the VS or the sinus zone, but it disagrees with the last four average. This is quick again, and the averages all kind of correlate to fib, fib, 
and it finishes charging here at this moment, but it doesn't deliver a shock until it sees one more. So you're not committed. And I think most devices, I don't know, Jared, maybe you can kind of um, you can kind of inform us here on this, but most devices nowadays are not committed shocks. So it gives them one more opportunity and then it has one more fib event and it says, all right, boom, you're getting a shock. Uh, Jared, do you know about that? Yeah, no, that's bang on, mate. Uh, I know Medtronic are two out of three. So once it's uh, charged, it'll look for two. If there's two fast intervals, uh, it will it will then uh, deliver a shock. If there's mm. not, then it's, so yeah, it's not committed. It's too fast. Okay, so it's two out of three, you said. Yes, yes. Okay. Two out of three after the charge is fast. Um, what, what, just for the people at home, and you, I mean, you two are the experts here in terms of what, what they're probably, if you may be getting confused, is in this little snapshot that we see here, we don't actually see what's happening maybe 10, 15 seconds prior to the mm -hmm. um, device detecting this is VF, where we see that VF next to the ATP in brackets. Is it, I mean, the best way I've learned with your, uh, your devices is, you know, the, there's three bins. You've got like a, a fibrillation bin, a tacky bin, and a sinus bin. And as the device is moving along, looking at these markers, these Fs and dashes and Ts, essentially whichever bin fills up first will then it, you'll get the treatment for that uh, for that zone. Is that a fair comment? No, it's, that's 100%. completely – yeah, I'm drawing my bins here. I'm also not an artist. Yeah, it's 100%. So each each one is like a bin here, and they're just – you're kind of filling up I'm not a great artist here. You're filling up your trash can um, here. But remember that um, every time you get a tacky or VF event, it also clears out the V sinus bin. So the V sinus doesn't continue. It, it clears out this counter. And then, you know, these keep going, keep going, keep going. You maybe have a sinus event. You know, you add another one here. Um, when you get enough V sinuses in a row, uh, or VSs in a row, that's when it will do return to sinus and that's a programmable amount. So I think it's like three is, is fast return to sinus. I think it's, what is it? Six or something is slow. Six return is to sinus? Uh, nominal. That's a normal response. Three okay. Fast and then uh slow, I think is eight, eight, eight or nine, maybe either way. If it's slow return to sinus, that yeah. means it makes it harder for the device to call the episode over which means at the same time, these bins are still filling up every single time. Um, so if you make it slow to return to sinus, you're really increasing the risk of them getting shocked, but you're also increasing the chance of them getting shocked when they need to be shocked as well. So it's all things to consider. Um, and I, I think that the HRS guidelines, I don't know, Jared, do you guys use a new, the ones they came out with in like 20, 2019, 2020? Certainly, yeah. I mean, certainly for your device, I do. I do VF from 230, I think a VT from 200, I think, and then VAT, uh, a slower VT from 170, I think, something like that. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, something along those lines. But I do, for your devices, I have a VF quite high at 230 and a VT at yeah. 200. Uh, for Medtronic, I usually have um, 200 for VF zone. Um and then any whatever if I have a VT zone, then it's just really whatever the VT rate is. Um, but yeah, so they do they do vary a little bit. So and that's important. They're just what you do with one device doesn't mean it's the same answer for every other device. So again, treat each one individually. Mm. Yeah, that, that's I think you can definitely apply like rules of rules of thumb. But yeah, I think that's definitely that's that's a key point is not everybody gets the same. Um, and I think you can program like 90% of the time it works, right? But there's 10% of the people that, you know, if you're not careful with their programming, you can really affect their their therapy. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So here's the answers. I'm going to leave this on the screen for those on YouTube. Uh, you can pause and review, but I think we answered all the questions. This is just a little more descriptive uh, answer to it. Um, one of the questions is, where do you run the template test in an Abbott programmer? So it's under, I don't know if you have the picture Andrew where you can find it but it's under tacky settings and then <laughs> it's not easy to find under tacky settings and then it's going to be the larger box where you actually indicate therapies um, and then underneath there it'll say like SVT settings you click on SVT settings and then morphology and then there's a little box where it says morphology template update um, I, I'll find you you'll see something I have a screenshot at the yeah. moment, where I could try to get one and, and send it your way or whatever, but that was correct and where you'd find it. It's, yeah. It's kind of buried a little bit. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not easy one to find. And then for the morphology template update, you just then program the settings to allow the intrinsic to conduct. So you can actually see what their intrinsic looks like and then start um, acquiring template. So you want to make sure you can allow them to conduct because if they're V pacing, you're never going to see it. You're never going to get a morphology. And then when it's done, it'll start putting a score and you hit stop temporary. Um, so maybe we can sit down and do like a screen recording of this as well. Um, We'll try to do that. I, uh, we're we're going to be, you know, doing a trip here in about two weeks. So I'll get some of that for you as well. But I appreciate the question there. I think that was pretty much everything. Oh, I wanted to show. Do you have anything you want to cover while I pull something else up? I'm just pulling up the HRS guidelines. Uh, or Jared, you know, whoever. I can't think of a thing. Uh the only thing I was going to suggest, it, it's, it's gone now because I think uh, you you lost your screen sharing, but on your oh. far field, oh, no, it's all right, man. Oh, just on your far, just for the people out there, just for the far field, on your far field channel, you see a, uh, a VS2. And I think that's just a, a little thing that we could maybe briefly talk over. That's when you're comparing the near field and the far field. Is that correct? And when they match, you get a VS2. Yep. Um, so if we, it's really good for the noise discrimination, isn't it? So if they, if the device detects noise on the far field, it will then compare that to the near field EGM. And if there's the same, same happening on the near field, then that, that's pos that supports a, a VT or an arrhythmia as where if you see noise on the far field, but not the near field, then that will support more noise and will therefore not, uh, deliver therapy. That's my understanding, but you're the expert. <laughs> So I think that's that's 100 percent right, but I think it's it's kind of reversed because the device doesn't actually use reversed, far right. field except to confirm. So if it sees something that could be noisy in the near field because for whatever what reason those electrodes are fouled up or something along those lines, right? It rechecks itself with the far field coil to can vector as well. And if gotcha. the coil to can, so if you see noise on the near field and or like what it thinks an evoked response or um, you know, a uh, depolarization of the heart on the near field it checks the far field and says do you agree and if it doesn't agree then it gets flagged am i getting that right or did i get that wrong andrew no you got that right i'm, I'm actually um i have a slide that i could show um and that's that's sort of like non-sustained rv over sensing gets okay well you pull this up yeah, that's that's yeah. a really good um that's a really good here. point there oh you do have it yeah, I right. can share my screen. Okay, you got it. Yeah, thanks, Jared, for bringing that up. That's that's a really yeah helpful thing on the Abbott. We need to do some more of these on the other devices because I feel very ignorant when I'm using any kind of other <laughs> device. <laughs> so can you guys see my screen here? Yes. Yeah, so this is just kind of a, a nice brief summary of what we were just kind of discussing. Um, so that algorithm is secure sense. And so it looks at near field and far field to see if there's a match. And ideally, so if we look at the example on the right where my mouse is, in a true VT or VF episode, we would expect to see vSense 2 on the far field channel correlating to every near field sensed event. And that's just showing that there's an alignment and that both channels are agreeing with each other. In an example where you had uh, either lead noise or um, anything extra cardiac, you would expect to see near field signals like this. So kind of non-physiologic, the device on the near field channel, you'd see all the ticks, but on the far field, you would just see, um, you wouldn't see any vSense twos and you would just see a mismatch between what we're seeing near field and far field. Um, and in this case, the device is designed or programmed to not deliver therapy in this situation because it's saying that there's a lot going on in the near field, but my far field is telling me that I'm in sinus rhythm. This is probably an example of lead noise. Um, so the devices are correctly diagnosing this as lead noise, whatever it may be, as opposed to this example on the right where we have a correlation near field and far field. Um, and so in this case, this is a true arrhythmia and we'd want to deliver therapy. Um, and if there was ever any mismatch, I think AJ was alluding to this, um, you would get the same alert that I kind of talked about in my first case study, 
a non-sustained RV over-sensing alert. And you could theoretically get that alert for a variety of different reasons. So as we talked about earlier, T-wave over-sensing was one of them, but we could theoretically get it for lead noise. Um, you could also see it for double counting of a wide R-wave. Um, so it's a really nice algorithm actually to kind of alert you of one, how's the lead functioning? Cause that's kind of what it's inherently designed for. But on top of that, it lets you know, um, T-wave over sensing. You can also potentially have a PVC that was, um, maybe seen on the near field channel, but not in the far field, depending on where it originated from. So there's a lot of different things that you could see from this algorithm, which is cool. Um, but I hope this picture was useful in distinguishing like true noise, true noise, and, and like a true example of VF. I think that's great. Yeah, perfect. I'll stop sharing now. All right. So two more things I want to share really quick. I know everyone we're getting kind of late into everyone's evening, so I appreciate your time. Um, so just so we have it, here is the 2019 guidelines. Uh, this was released. Uh, these are the recommended programming. And I will send this once again to the WhatsApp group, or at least cite the previous example of it. But um, for example, Abbott, it makes your recommendations for your Brady settings, for your VF settings. Um, there is obviously flexibility here. Some people are comfortable with a little less programming. This is obviously pretty heavy. Um, but if you had these settings, then the case example that I gave would have most likely not received therapy for a shock they shouldn't have. On the inverse, you could also see a patient that maybe should have received therapy that didn't uh, quicker. So it, it really depends on the patient. You know, if we know that they never get their heart rate above 200 unless it's VT or VF, then maybe a simple shock setting of VT detection, 200 shock is what they need, right? If they're young and they they exercise or they have a lot of AFib with RVR, um, then maybe we need to be a little bit more conservative with uh, with our programming to um, to not shock in those cases. So just things to keep in mind. It has your Abbott settings, has your recommendations for Bio, for Boston, for Medtronic. Um, so I'll send that back out again. And yeah. then... Can you share that sorry? with me too, AJ? I don't think I have that stored on my computer. Can you send that to oh, me? Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. I keep it on my desktop because somebody calls me to program and I just always want to reference to make sure. So I'll send it to you for sure. Yeah, thank you. I, I recommend keeping it at the top. Um, all right. So the last one here I want to share, we're going to go through one more question for next week. Um, so uh, things to keep in mind, what rhythm is a patient in? What type of device is used in this example? What do the O's on the marker channel indicate? What does the T2 in the marker channel indicate? Was the ATP successful? What accounts for the shorter cycle lengths between the ATP stimuli? What potential programming changes should be considered? And what type of ICD is most likely implanted in this patient? So we're gonna hold off on answering anything here. We're just gonna go ahead and go through it really quick. So I'm just gonna stream by here. And obviously I'm gonna send this out to the WhatsApp group, but for our friends who are gonna be picking this up on YouTube, I just wanna make sure that you have it a week early. So we have our settings here. I'm going to pause here for a second. And then we're going to scroll down here. So as you can see, looks pretty messy. Last page here. We see a nice big shock. And that's it. All right. So I think that really, I think we covered quite a bit. I really appreciate uh, Andrew, you know, for leading us in this discussion and giving us those really great examples of a fantastic PowerPoint. Um, and then, you know, thank you, Jared, for participating as well um, and giving us your insights, especially outside the realm of Abbott, because Lord knows we're ignorant when it comes to that. Um, thank you, everyone else, for participating. Um, you know, the questions, you know, the engagement is fantastic. It makes us feel like, you know, there's there's someone on the other side of this. So we appreciate you. And then for everyone else, um, you know, picking this up on YouTube, uh, there'll be more of this to come, uh, both, you know, teaching as well as, um, you know, more specific deep dives into algorithms and things like that. So please reach out if you have any suggestions or things you'd like to cover. And we're happy to uh, to make that happen. And everyone else enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening and we'll we'll talk soon.
Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, boys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.